many copies of the one eigenspace. They have a fixed space and have many ones in their eigenvalues. Uh, but if they're diagonalizable, then, uh, and I mean diagonal, sorry, I should say semi-simple. When I pass to an algebraic closure over a suitably large extension field, if they're semi-simple, so they're diagonalizable, then they should have one other eigenvalue that's not a one. I'm going to call it zeta in this example here. That's a ten point of this one. Zeta up there. I can diagonalize it to look like this. And zeta will be some root of unity, but in this field k. It's not a complex root of unity unless I'm working with those complexes. On the other hand, there are these, oh, and I'm sorry, so they're called reflections because if we were talking about usual, you know, Euclidean reflections in, a, in our usual uh, Euclidean space, right, uh, I think of the reflecting <coughs> hyperplane as this co-dimension one subspace, that's the one eigenspace, and then perpendicular, I've got this line on which the action is to negate, and so that zeta would be a, a second root of unity, namely negative one. Okay. That's where the name comes from. However, in characteristic P, we suddenly have this strange situation. <coughs> the other eigenvalue can also be a 1. Right? All the eigenvalues could be 1. It could be unipotent. These non-diagonalizable reflections, they're, they're Jordan canonical form. When I write pass to an algebraic closure, an extension field has this little 2 by 2 non-trivial Jordan block. These things are called transvections. And uh, they only exist in characteristic P. <coughs> These elements will have uh, order P. And they are somehow the interesting, you could call them the annoyance, or the thing that makes it interesting when you're working in characteristic P is the existence of these non-diagonalizable reflections. They somehow make the theory a little more interesting. Anyway, don't worry about it in characteristic P. In characteristic zero. Uh, now let's just do this. And our reflection group is probably what you were thinking. It's a subgroup, a finite subgroup of your general linear group that's generated by reflections, pseudo-reflections. Okay. And so our favorite example is the symmetric group on the numbers 1 through n. I want to think of it, though, as permuting the coordinates in the space v, which is k to the n, having you know, uh, standard basis vectors. And the symmetric group permutes the standard basis vector. OK, so it embeds in GLMK as permutation matrices. And yes, it is generated by reflections because we know the symmetric group is generated by transpositions, transpositions of the coordinate i and j. I want to think of that element r as the reflection whose fixed hyperplane is the space where the i and j coordinate are equal, so xi equals xj. And so I'm writing e super r, <laughs> that means a fixed space for r. And in the uh, perpendicular to the xi equals xj hyperplane, so in the root direction, ei minus ej, it negates the root. So yes, that's a usual kind of reflection. And I, just to think about other examples that we might you know, generalize in the direction that, I mean, you can also think of it as the symmetries of a regular polytope, the regular simplex, in which I've got the vertices numbered 1, 2, up to n, here n is 3. So this is an equilateral triangle. And the symmetric group acts by permuting the vertices that extends to a linear symmetry of that regular simplex. And when you look at all you know, n factorial, in this case, three factorial symmetries, you get a group generated by reflections. So these transpositions each end up being reflections in various symmetry lines. And then there's rotation, like 120 degrees, 240 degrees, et cetera. And if I have the uh, here's n equals 4. All I've drawn with these dotted lines is, you know, this hyperplane arrangement pictures that we've seen where the symmetry hyperplanes, the tri various transpositions, their hyperplanes slice through and give you the very centric subdivision on the boundary of the, the regular simplex. Any, any questions so far on why? So all I'm saying is the symmetric group is a reflection group. Okay. <coughs> on the other hand, I eventually don't understand that FQ analog. The general linear group over FQ is, the finite general linear group, is a reflection group. And I want to start thinking of it as a reflection group. Okay, and I want to convince you that the analogies here are not stupid. This is actually worthwhile. And inside of it, I've got the, the special linear group, you know, <coughs> the determinant one matrices over my finite field. They're both generated by reflections. So 
first of all, you can check that the, this special linear group is actually generated by those transvections. Remember, transvections have determinant one. All of their eigenvalues are one. And then they have this upper triangular part. Using these upper triangular unipotent matrices, you can actually generate the entire special linear group. It's an exercise. It's, it's not too hard. Um, and then if you throw in one uh, semi-simple refraction that has, uh, I don't know, take a generator for FQ, as a, a, say a multiplicative generator for, for FQ's uh, multiplicative group, put that as your non-unit eigenvalue in a reflection, the semi-simple reflection, and you can generate GIFQ by reflections. So it is a reflection. Okay. But that's actually not enough. So to tell you the truth, I don't consider all groups generated by reflections as really reflection groups. I actually want the invariant theory to tell me which ones are really the reflection groups. So I, I'm going to get into this more, but I actually think of a taxonomy, a hierarchy, in which a lot of combinatorics tries to perceive, OK, maybe this is situation where we should make this a little smaller for a moment and then read it. OK, so up at the top it says, invariant theory distinguishes reflection groups. What's down here at the bottom? You can't read this, but I'll enlarge it in a moment. Symmetric groups. OK, this is type AN minus 1, SM. Tons of combinatorics happens here. Okay. Then, for example, like in, in the talk of, of uh, Angela Carnavale, you know, she was working with symmetric groups and hyperoctahedral groups, types B and C. You know, there were some conjectures by these guys, and you know, she and her friends were able to figure out what's happening in type A and type B and C, and then they were able to figure out what was happening in type D. And many times, you know, this is a, a laborious process. It takes us a while to figure out, you know, what are the analogs going up to here? And then there was a results, you know, that we know in type A, we know what to do in, in type B or C, so type B and C, I might also want to think about that as symmetries of this other family of regular polytopes, the cubes and the hyperoctahedra, the cross polytopes, which are the convex hull of plus or minus the unit basis vectors in our end. So these two families of regular polytopes, they're polar duals to each other, and so they have the same symmetry group, assigned permutation matrices, and there's a lot of Interesting combinatorics that we really only know how to do at the current moment in types A and B. Okay. It happens. And then there's some things that we know for the symmetry groups of regular polytopes. Okay, so these are a special case of Coxeter groups, finite reflection groups where the Coxeter diagram has no branches, where the Coxeter diagram is not worked, if, if people know this. There are actually some results that kind of naturally we only know how to do them here. And then there are finite Coxeter groups. So finite groups that have a, all right, now I should be actually, I'm going up the taxonomy here, so let me make this, this larger. Right. Okay, so we had symmetric groups at the bottom, symmetric, and the hyperoctahedral groups. Here was, okay, I forgot to say this. So type D is now a vial group. These are crystallographic real reflection groups that you're working over the real field, but you're also stabilizing some full rank lattice. You, know, you could think of it as being the root lattice for your vial group or the weight lattice. One of these full rank lattices is actually preserved by the group. This constrains the angles of reflection between reflecting hyperplanes. It's a non-trivial restriction, and there are times when we need those lattices or those uh, kind of integrality structure to prove results. Or there's some things that we only know how to say or even phrase for vial groups that we don't know how to do for arbitrary real reflection groups. All right, so over on this side, we've got some non-crystallographic ones among the regular polytopes. For example, when I take the icosahedron and dodecahedron, I get type H3. And this is there's no you know, full rank lattice inside of three-dimensional space that's preserved by that group. Or there's these uh, four-dimensional examples, H4, the 120 cell, the 600 cell, non-crystallographic. F4, fortunately, is actually a vial group. <coughs> really, it's in the intersection of this and this, but I, I didn't do such an intersection. Anyway, there's this whole taxonomy. Okay, so we have 
Real reflection groups, W inside of GLNR, I don't know if you can read that. It's bigger. So who are these? These are the Coxeter systems. They have this you know, pairwise order presentation and generated by involutions as abstract groups, but in the case where W is a finite group, right? many Coxeter systems lead to infinite groups W, but the finite ones turn out to be the same ones that have a representation as Euclidean ref generated by Euclidean reflections in a real vector space. <coughs> okay. It just happens that it's not obvious, but it happens. Okay, I actually care a lot about complex reflection groups. Sometimes these are called unitary groups generated by reflections, buggers, sorry. Um, and uh, these came up in the work of, of Shepard and Todd back in 1955. They actually classified all of these. They had, there was enough uh, results around in the literature, you know, going back to the 1800s, <coughs> the century, they were actually able to classify all of the finite subgroups of GLNC generated by reflections. It's a long list that has the, the groups from Lee theory, you know, the card time killing classification appears in there. So the hot, there's infinite families. This is a notation <coughs> that <coughs> encompasses all of their infinite families. This G of an integer, 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 okay, they called it N is the last integer, is for N by N matrices. The first integer tells you Instead of permutation matrices having zeros and ones, we have zeros and roots of unity. The first integer in their list tells you what kind of roots of unity. I've written it as DE because it's supposed to be divisible by the second integer. But anyway, they're DE roots of unity. And by matrices, DE roots of unity in this places where you would have had ones in a permutation matrix, so the monomial matrices. And then the E is saying that the product of the non-zero roots of unity that you find in the matrix is either a D root of unity or a D root of unity, and I can't remember which, but let's not worry about it. Yeah, the point is, this encompasses all of the infinite <coughs> families of finite subgroups of GLNC generated by reflections, pseudo-reflections. And then the exceptional cases have all of the exceptional Lie groups. It has the symmetry groups of exceptional regular complex polytopes. There is such a notion. Let me not talk about what it is, but talk about what a, it's hard to talk about complex polytope, but actually we know what a regular complex polytope means. Shepard came up with this, and it's, it, uh, it really works. And so there's exceptional cases, but this is the infinite family. And Shepard and Todd, having proven this class classification, they were able to prove this theorem about the invariant theory. What they proved is that they are exactly the finite subgroups of GLNC such that when we let them act on a polynomial ring, so now for this example, k is equal to c, we let them act by linear substitutions on polynomials, and the invariant subalgebra is again polynomial, generated by n algebraically independent elements. <coughs> so if you're like, you know, if you're an algebraic geometer, what you should be thinking is the coordinate ring of the motion space of the affine space by W is again <coughs> affine. Let me say that again. The quotient space of the original affine space that had coordinates x1 through fn is an affine space whose coordinates are f1 through fn. That's a very rare thing to happen. It's very, very special. It distinguishes these groups. And this is actually where I should stop. You notice this parenthesis up here? So I'm going to point out later a result that, of Ser that says, over any field, if the, in, the quotient of the affine space is affine, if the invariant subring under that group actions, finite group actions, polynomial, you are generated by reflections, but not all finite subgroups generated by reflections have this property. We only want to consider the ones that have this property. All reflection groups is a little bit too large. I don't know, you know, that all the combinatorics works well in this situation. Just being generated by reflections is not enough. You want this invariant theoretic characterization of what a reflection is. <coughs> and I'll talk about it, you know, general linear group over FQ, this is SL special linear group over FQ. Tell them to call that. Uh, this is uh, these two both have this polynomial invariance problem. Okay. 
So let's on. Yeah, so we're talking about a variant theory. What's the setup? I've got a subgroup of the general linear group, uh, and so these n by n invertible matrices, they certainly act on my polynomial ring over that same field k in n variables via linear substitutions. I'm using s for, I don't know, symmetric algebra of the dual space, or just s to have the name of a good polynomial ring letter. This is, by the way, one of the reasons why I'm using the frock tour s for the symmetric group. Okay, so you, you let your uh, invertible matrices act by linear substitution. So if I'm given a polynomial in n variables and I'm given an invertible matrix that's in this group W, I just apply W inverse to the variables, right? Because these polynomials, uh, you know, you're, it's a function of the variables, you have to put in the inverse to keep it a left action. I'm, I'm usually talking about left actions in groups, so don't be annoyed by this W inverse rather than W. I'm going to be talking about the invariants of a group anyway. So if you're invariant under all of the W's, you're invariant under all of the W inverses because the group is closed under conversion. OK, and so the central object for us is this invariant ring. S super capital W means the fixed points of all the elements of W. It's the sub-algebra, the sub-ring of W invariant polynomials. Right? If you add two invariant polynomials, you get an invariant polynomial. If you multiply two invariant polynomials, so it is a subring, subalgebra. And you know, in combinatorics classes, even we teach this in maybe in Galois theory, I don't know. Somewhere in our algebra classes or our curriculum, we learn the, the first example is the symmetric group permuting the variables. And notice I just wrote a field here. It doesn't matter which field. This is a characteristic free result that says uh, the invariant polynomials under the symmetric group permuting indices, right? That's an example of these linear substitutions of variables, is a polynomial algebra itself. Uh, I've written E1, E2 up to EN for the, a generating set of such polynomials. They're not unique, okay? I am almost always gonna wanna pick them to be homogeneous elements. Their degrees turn out to be unique, They're determined by the Hilbert series of the invariant ring, but they themselves are choices. And one common choice, probably the one that you know, you first learn, when you learn this fundamental theorem of symmetric functions, saying it's a polynomial ring, is to take the elementary symmetric functions. So E1 is the sum of the variables. E2 is the sum of products of two different variables. E3 is the sum of products of three different variables. And there's only one uh, product of n different variables. That's the end. Okay. Any, any questions? <coughs> so here's the situation where the invariants are polynomial. <clears throat> and, as I was saying, this is special. <coughs> you should not expect this in general for a finite subgroup that the invariant ring is going to be a polynomial subalgebra. Right? What should you expect? Well, you know, Nerfic proved, Hilbert and Nerfic actually, you know, thought a lot about this, and Nerfic came up with sort of the, the best characteristic-free kinds of proofs. What you always have is that the invariant ring inside of the, the full polynomial algebra, that's an integral extension of ring. So what does this mean? It just means that every polynomial <coughs> satisfies a uh, monic polynomial with coefficients in here. You can write it down. You can take the product. If your new variable, you want the, some polynomial f to satisfy, if the variable is t, you write down the product of t minus all of the images of f under the group w. And that gives you an integral dependence. So every polynomial in here is integrally dependent upon this ring. It satisfies a monic polynomial with coefficients in this ring. <coughs> Easy to see. In particular, because uh, this ring is finitely generated <coughs> over the field by uh, the variables, it has a finite set of algebra generators. So this means that the full polynomial algebra is going to be a finitely generated module over the invariant ring. There are going to be a finite list of not invariant polynomials necessarily, such that everybody in the polynomial ring can be written as SW combinations of this finite list. And, okay, so in particular, 
what this means is that the invariant ring is, is somewhat large inside of the whole polynomial ring. It needs to have n algebraically independent elements within it. Its curl dimension has to be n, right? The polynomial ring is this coordinate ring for an n-dimensional space. It's got n algebraically independent elements, the variables, x1 through xn. This thing certainly has to contain n algebraically independent elements. But in general, that won't be enough. You'll need more generators. And there will be relations, syzygies, among your generators. OK, so it's a, the invariant ring is definitely finitely generated. It's nefarian, in fact. So this is where some of this, the words came from. And uh, it's finally generated over the field, and it's certainly going to require at least n generators. <coughs> and I was mentioning this result. So Shepard and Todd, using this classification of the, the finite subgroups of GLNC that were reflection groups, they proved the following. <coughs> and I'll, I'll talk about Chevrolet in, in a second. If you have a finite subgroup of GLNC that's you know doing these linear substitution of variables, the invariant ring is polynomial, so it can be generated by n algebraically independent elements. If and only if W is a reflection group. If and only if something else happens. Now, let me let me go back. Let's just focus on this for a If and only if it's a reflection group. So this is already a, <coughs> a striking thing that the reflection groups were distinguished by the invariant theory. And let me say that Shepard and Todd proved this by the class using their classification. But Chevrolet came up with an insightful proof. You know, something. Uh, it's quite nice. So I won't get into it. And it was basically the same year. Okay. There's another way in which they are distinguished, and this is going to be extremely important for explaining the, the combinatorics here. It's also, if and only if, the co-invariant algebra is distinguished in a certain way. So co-invariant algebra is turn out to be crucial for understanding Q-analogs. What's the co-invariant algebra? I take the polynomials, okay? I mod out by the ideal within the polynomials generated by the invariants that have positive degrees. So S super W, remember, was the invariance. S super W plus means the positive graded elements. Get rid of the field. You don't want to mod out by a constant, you know, the field itself. The ideal that it generates, those are units. So this would, if I modded out by the zero degree elements, this quotient would be zero. Model by the invariance of positive degree. So if you like, in this situation, this ideal is generated by those algebraically independent elements f1 through fn. You take the ideal that they generate, you mod out by it. That's called the regular, sorry, it's called the co-invariant algebra. And this ideal is w stable. Things, you know, since w uh, fixes these generators, the, the invariance, it certainly stabilizes the ideal that they generate. So this quotient ring is carries a W action. I took a W a ring with a W action, I modded out by a W stable ideal. I get an action of W on the quotient ring. It's finite dimensional. And here's the remarkable thing: in the, in the reflection group case, the W action here, so this is by linear substitution of the variables, just taking the quotient. So this is the action by linear substitution here is the same as the regular representation. It's isomorphic to the regular representation of W. Okay. So this is interesting because the regular representation of a finite group, if someone says, give me a grading, tell me about the, the regular representation as a graded vector space, I would say, what are you talking about? A priori. If it's a reflection group inside the GLNC, I do. This is not to be you know, underestimated. So Q analogs in combinatorics, many times what it's just hiding is like a gradient. This is what I was trying to say you know, in the first talk about desirable properties. Many of these Q analogs, they're just keeping track of a grading or you know, a SL2C character. This is a place in which Suddenly, the regular representation, which we know is important in representation theory of finite groups, it has a graded incarnation. And so we want to use this co-invariant algebra as the graded version. Okay. That's the moral of this. <coughs> OK. Now comes Longspring. Yes? 
Mm-hmm. This is the associated grade that conducts a certain iteration. I mean, in the reflection group case, I think there are almost surely some of the different bases that we know. I think I could, you know, do some, yeah, something where it's a filtered version and that's the associated grade. Well, but to tell you the truth, though, I mean, in, in type A, yes, I, I want to say yes. I'm actually not sure if I know how to do that uniformly, say, for all complex reflection groups, which you just said, but a natural filtration, so that's the associated grade. Not quite clear. So, other questions? Yeah. You, you can do it for the infinite family, the GD. Yeah, okay, so if I can do it for no. type A, I'm, I'm pretty sure for, for the infinite family, we could do it too. Yeah, so Alex, one thing that I'm thinking about is there are these things called constant polynomials, which come up, you know, and certainly for vial groups, those exist. And they kind of have as a leading term, you know, something which is graded of the correct degree to match this grading in the co-invariance algebra. And they carry, they're free, you know, the, the group would act freely on these. So that's one way you could do it, I think, for vial groups. So is the grading just induced by the grading of the um, polynomial? Yeah, so on the, uh, absolutely. Even though, I mean, the corrosion is not homogeneous, right? Um, it is, because the F1 through Fn, each, I'm always picking those F1 through Fn homogeneous elements. You, you can always oh, do see. that. Yeah, that's that's a great so point. So I couldn't take the whole invariant stuff like this. You couldn't take, what did you say? So you, you have to, so Fi has to be homogeneous. Like yes. That's right. I should have said this. That you can always pick the basic invariant because the W was acting, preserving gradients. So if I'm an invariant polynomial, it means every one of my homogeneous pieces is an invariant polynomial because W is acting by these linear substitutions, preserving degree. So it's not too hard to see. If you came up with some inhomogeneous basic invariants f1 through fn, I can convert them to homogeneous ones. Yes, that are algebraically yeah. independent. Okay, so we, in some sense, we've kind of found the Q analog is the grading there. It's, it's going to produce Q analogs. Where's that cyclic action going to come in? So Springer, in this uh, paper in, what's it, 1971, 1972? Yeah, 72. <clears throat> he added an important enhancement. There's an extra feature in this story. And for the moment, I'm talking about the complex case. Okay, and then we'll talk about the, the modular cases later. So, in a, a finite reflection group inside of GLNC, so it's acting on C to the N, I'm going to say that an element of, of my group is a regular element if it has an eigenvector in C to the N. So, uh, you know, we're already working over an algebraically closed field, so all the eigenvalues are there, and so eigenvectors are there. These are elements of finite order, so there's no diagonalizable, diagonalizable excuse me, semi-simplicity issues, diagonalizability issues. Everybody's diagonalizable. Finite order, working in characteristic zero, <coughs> algebraically closed field. And uh, so you look at its eigenvectors and you call it a regular element if it has a regular eigenvector. <coughs> so that, what does regular mean? Uh, an eigenvector which is permuted regularly by the group that has no stabilizer except you know, the, the identity subgroup. <coughs> this turns out uh, vectors in, when you have these finite reflection groups acting, it turns out that uh, to be to have a regular orbit under a finite reflection group over the complexes is the same as avoiding the reflecting hyperplanes. Obviously, if you lie in any of the reflecting hyperplanes, you've got a non-trivial stabilizer. That's the only issue in reflection groups. It's the only way in which you can avoid having some non-free action. So an element is regular if it has a regular eigenvector, one with a regular a free orbit. And then I'm even going to want to know what's the regular eigenvalue. So I call zeta. A, uh, a regular eigenvalue for C if there is this eigenvector for C that has the eigenvalue zeta. And I'm going to need that zeta because it's going to be my zeta. The, the <coughs> okay. So Schwinger says, let's look at these elements, these regular elements in finite reflection groups. And he says, yes, I'll do you one better. Take a regular element, regular eigenvalue zeta in a finite reflection group. Not only is the co-invariant algebra isomorphic to the group algebra, 
where you're letting the W act by linear substitutions here, and you know, the group algebra, it's the left regular representation, it's left translation by W. But he's gonna put in the commuting action here and a commuting action here of a cyclic group generated by that regular element C, and it's still gonna be an isomorphism. Right? So there's some extra commuting action being carried along with <coughs> this isomorphism. How does it go? On this side, where the W is doing linear substitutions of the variable, some non-trivial grade-preserving linear substitutions, the C is acting by scalar substitutions. I've deprived you of the formula. The C just takes each variable and scales by zeta. Okay. So no matter what linear substitution you're doing in W, this C acting on the variables, x1 for x1, is acting by a scalar times the identity matrix. Of course, that always commutes. So over here, this sort of scalar substitution, it's trivially commuting with the W action. I have a W cross C action in this graded space, it's a, and it's a graded W cross C action. Even worse, this action, you can really think about it in terms of the grading. In degree one, it's C, the generator of the cyclic group, scales by zeta. In degree two, C scales by zeta squared. In degree three, it scales by zeta cubed. So right, the grading here is giving you the C eigenspaces on the left. It's diagonalizing the action for you. On the right, how am I going to make C uh, commute with the W action by left translation? It's the right translation. It's the group algebra. So it's, it's got left and right multiplication by the group. <coughs> Isomorphisms, deep proofs. Any questions? And that C is going to be my C. And better yet, guess who the regular elements are in the symmetric group? I already said this when you asked your question, Mike. N cycles, it's, it's not too hard to see if I have a regular element in a reflection group, right? It had to have a regular eigenvector powers of it will also have that regular eigenvector. So powers of a regular element are still regular elements. In the symmetric group, n cycles are regular elements. I need to exhibit for you. So 1 goes to 2 goes to 3 goes to n dot dot dot. I need to exhibit a vector with complex coefficients allowed. Right? My symmetric group was acting you know, over the integers. It was acting in a real space, real n by n matrices if you like, but I've, I'm allowed to extend to the complex world to find its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. An n cycle has eigenvalues, which are you know, powers of zeta, where zeta is e to the 2 pi i over n. And what's a zeta eigenvector? I write down the vector that has coordinates 1, zeta, zeta squared, zeta cubed, dot, dot, dot. And now you think about it. What happens when this thing, permuting the positions right, in this vector, it shifts over the positions, it has the same effect as multiplying by zeta. This thing is a zeta eigenvector. And it avoids the reflecting hyperplanes because the reflecting hyperplanes are xi equals xj, two coordinates equal. It has all distinct coordinates, so it's off the hyperplanes. It has a regular orbit. In other words, the permutations of this vector, when I permute its coordinates, I get n factorial different things. It's a free orbit. Let me step back a second. What are you asking, Alex? Do you want me to advance or go back up? up, up. Sound all right? Okay. And then I claim you can still pull this trick with n minus 1 cycles. Right? The n minus 1 cycle said 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to the n minus 1 back to 1, and it was fixing the nth coordinate. It's doing nothing to the nth coordinate. I stick a 0 in the nth coordinate, and then let omega, since it's not zeta, be a, an n minus first root of unity. Right, the eigenvalues of this thing are going to be uh, n minus first roots of unity and, uh, and then an extra one, I guess. But let me not focus on the extra one eigenvalue. So omega is an n minus first root of unity. I put one omega squared, omega cubed, dot, 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 up to, I go to the n minus first coordinate and then stop and put a zero in the nth coordinate. That vector, you can check. It's an omega eigenvector for this n minus one cycle. And its coordinates are still all distinct. 
right? They're either roots of unity that are distinct or the zero, which is not a root of unity. So this is a regular vector, avoids the hyperplanes, it has a free orbit, and it's an eigenvector for this element. So n minus 1 cycles are regular elements. And their powers are regular elements. And it fails if I try to do n minus 2 cycles, whether I put swapping the last two or whether I put fixing the last two. You cannot produce such an eigenvector. Let me uh, rephrase uh, Schmier's result. Some of you may have actually read you know, this uh, 1972 paper of Schmier. He didn't quite phrase it this way. In fact, this phrasing, I can't remember where I first saw it. It may have been in the paper of uh, Kraskevich and Damon, uh, where they, they phrased it this other way in terms of isomorphism of W cross C representations. But let, let me give a phrasing that's more similar to Schmier's, and it's also going to come up in, in what I'm saying. So, uh, I want to talk about degrees of representations and fake degrees of representation. So degrees <coughs> are dimensions of a representation, fake degrees a Q analog. So let me just remind you a little bit. Finite group representation theory. So when I have uh, W representations U1 and U2, we're talking finite dimensional complex in you know, the tame representation theory situation. The intertwiner, you know, the inner product, the W inner product of U1 and U2, it's the inner product of their characters. You just average the values of the first character on W inverse and the second character on W as W runs over the group. And this is supposed to be the dimension, yes, yeah, the dimension of the, the intertwiner space, the space of linear maps from the, the space uh, U1 to U2 that are W equivariant, that commute with the action of W. No, I'm sorry, if you've never seen this stuff, but I mean, okay, this is a lead theory meeting. I'm not allowed to say that. You've seen this stuff, right? Okay. This is the tame representation. So this, uh, I'm going to be talking about you know, these, these Hom spaces. And in particular, I want to remind you that one way to get at the dimension of the U, the dimension of your space, the degree of the representation, is just to take its intertwiner with the regular representation. The left regular representation carries each irreducible as many times as its degree, and therefore you know, any representation, you break it up into its irreducibles, you take its, its intertwiner, its inner product, with the regular representation, and you're just going to get back the dimension of you. So this is how I want to think about the degree of a representation, so that we can say what the fake degree is in the reflection group case. OK, I, I want a Q analog, but I can only do this for reflection groups. So again, W is a finite reflection group inside of GLNC. The U fake degree polynomial F super U of Q, what is it? Well, on the one hand, it's a generating function where I'm using Q as a generating function variable for the dimensions of the intertwiner, or, you know, so this, uh, this inner product of U with the ith graded piece in the covariance algebra. Right? Remember, the covariance algebra is my graded version of the regular representation. So I'm just sticking it in here. It's got this grading, so let me keep track of what's happening in each grade and make a generating function variable for what its inner product is with you. This isn't my idea. I mean, this is, you know, goes back to this thing. I, I'm not sure. Maybe earlier. Certainly the terminology goes back to this thing. And so what I want to think about this is that this Hom space, right, when I look at the W equivariant maps from any representation into the, the covariance algebra, the covariance algebra is a graded object, so this Hom space is a graded object. You can talk about you know, whether homomorphisms of U into this space, what's their degree? And what degree do they land? You know, if I have a homomorphism, I can break it up into various components as to where it sends <coughs> the, the things in U. And so this is really just the Hilbert series, the graded Hilbert series for this Hom space into a graded representation. And U is an arbitrary, ungraded representation. All right. And so here's the way Springer really said it. He said it for the irreducibles, but then it follows for all of them. What he really said is when you have a regular element in your complex reflection group with a regular, regular eigenvalue zeta, what he proved is that the character value on regular elements 
You just take the fake degree polynomial and you plug in zeta. So the fake degree polynomial for your representation had a Q in it. And these particular character values, the traces of regular elements in any representation, their values are hidden in the fake degree polynomial. By just substitution. It's kind of like this. And in particular, <coughs> you can deduce from this, suppose your representation had some basis which is permuted by C. So remember my linear algebra paradigm, you know, where you might hope for something insightful to happen to prove one of these. If this U has some basis that's permuted by your cyclic group elements, you know, just by sending them to each other, then you're automatically going to get one of these cyclic sieving phenomena in which you had the, the basis elements are indexed by some set x. x of q is the fake degree polynomial for that representation. And c is this cyclic group you know, generated by the regular element. It's just, it, it follows immediately from Schrenger's theorem. Okay. And so, let me give you a couple examples, two important examples of, of fake degrees. One of them I'm not, I'm not going to use for any cyclic sieving phenomena. Look, it has been used by other people, but just sort of it makes it seem more familiar. Maybe even people have seen these formulas. What about in the symmetric group when I take irreducible representations for you? Right? Irreducible representations of the symmetric group SN, let me remind you, they're indexed by partitions, lambda 1 greater than lambda 2, number partitions. So these are the parts of lambda, and uh, I want them to sum up. So I write this absolute value of lambda is the weight of lambda. They should sum up to n. These index the irreducibles. And the, the dimension, the degree of the irreducible corresponding to the partition lambda is what's called the number of standard Young tableau P of shape lambda. I'll draw you some pictures in a second. You assign numbers from 1 to n to the, the boxes, and the cells, and the Ferris diagram for lambda in such a way that they increase across the, the rows and as you go down the columns. Uh, I'll show you the picture. And this is Young, you know, the, the Reverend Young in 1927 <laughs> proven this. And then in 1954, there was this famous uh, frame Robinson thrall hook formula that counted these things, you know, sort of simultaneously discovered by Thrall and by Freeman Rod. It's a cute story about it. But anyway. So there's a beautiful product formula for this uh, degree of the irreducibles of the symmetric group. You take n factorial and you divide by these things called the hook lengths, the product of the hook lengths. You write down the Ferrer's diagram for lambda. So this has got the, uh, if lambda is 3, 2, you put three cells, three boxes in the first row, two boxes in the second row, you draw this thing. And you, uh, for each box, you count how many cells there are in to, weekly to its right and weekly <coughs> below it. Total that up. That's the hook length. So in this case, this is a little too small for you to read. But, um, I, I wrote down the. Uh, what am I trying to do? I'm using the wrong thing. Yeah, you still can't read. Anyway. Here are the standard Young tableau. There are five of them. You know, I assign the numbers one through five, <laughs> increasing across rows, increasing down columns. The, I claim that the dimension of that irreducible representation according to that, corresponding to the space will be five. And you get it from the hook formula. This box has a hook of size one, hook of size one, hook of size two, hook of size three, hook of size four. And you put five factorial over the product of those numbers. That gives you this dimension. And sure enough, 5 factorial divided by 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 times 1, the hooks is, is 5. So that's how many tableau there would be. And so what are the Q analogs? Let me make this smaller again. So Lustig computed, he was interested in these fake degrees for the reasons of the, you know, the Chevalier groups, and algebraic groups over the finite fields, and their representations. So in 79, uh, roughly, he computed that this Q analog, this a fake degree polynomial for the irreducible representations of the symmetric group. It's not the number of Young tableau of shape lambda, but you count them according to some statistic, like I was saying. There's some statistic called the major index of the tableau, 
Well, what's the major index? Yeah, don't worry. I mean, it's something, you know, some combinatorial thing. You, you, count, you look for the entries in the tableau i such that the i appears in a row weakly above, strictly above the row where i plus 1 occurs. You call that the descent, and you sum up the values of the descent. I, you know, it's not something you should worry about, but there's some statistic on these tableau. You total up you know, q to that statistic, and you get this fake degree q analog. It's, in this case, it ends up being q squared times the q analog of the number 5 instead of just equaling the number 5. And then <coughs> Stanley had a, a product formula that's you know, the q analog of the frame Robinson for all hook formula. The key, the, another way to express this same fake degree is the Q analog of n factorial divided by the product of the Q analogs of the hooks, <coughs> the hook sizes, just what you would hope, uh, up to a power of Q. That extra power of Q is put zeros in the first row of your shape, ones in the second row of your shape, twos, etc. and just sum up those numbers. That's what this, you can't even read this thing, but it's, that's what the power of Q is in front. So that Q squared that's in front is this zeros, ones, twos, filling the shape, adding them up. Okay, so there's, there's four minutes. The more important example for what we're going to do, let me, let me show you this. Break. <coughs> <coughs> what about if my combinatorial set X had a transitive action of my reflection loop? Say it's, you know, the symmetric group acts transitively on my object. Then, I can tell you what the fake degree is in other terms, meaningful terms. So what are transitive actions? They're coset actions, right? When I have a transitive action of a group on a set, I don't care whether it's finite. Then you just pick any particular element in X, you look at the isotropy subgroup, the stabilizer subgroup, and you're really just acting on the cosets of that isotropy subgroup. So let me name it. When I have a transitive action, let me call the isotropy subgroup, pick one, the unique up to conjugacy, call it W prime, inside of W. So this permutation representation on x, so that's what I'm calling it's u sub x. I began with a finite set x that was transitively acted on by my group. So this u of x, I just mean the permutation representation by permutation matrices. Make the elements of x in a basis in a space. And see what that representation is. It's really this coset representation. So I'm going to use this notation, c of w mod w prime. So left translation of cosets. And the degree, of course, is the number of cosets of W prime. It's the size of X. It's the index of W prime and W. It's the quotient of W, the cardinality of W by the cardinality of W prime. All right, so I want to think about it that way. I'm going to give you a Q analog of this thing, the quotient of the cardinality of W by the cardinality of W prime. That's what I want to Q analogize. I'm allowed to use that verb. Okay, so what is this fake degree? So the fake degree in general, Springer says, okay, so I'm supposed to take the covariant algebra, I take this permutation representation ux, I look at this graded Hom space, I look at this thing, and I find its Hilbert series. And now let's think about this. The homomorphisms from a permutation action like this, a transitive permutation action, if I'm permuting the cosets of W, how do you get the W homomorphisms from a, a coset action into your space? Let's just take the W prime fixed space. Right, it's much simpler than a HOM here. Okay, so let's think about this. I need to tell you where the identity coset goes, right? In particular, that's one of the things that I have to tell you where it goes into my representation of e. Once I tell you where the identity coset of, of W prime goes, then <laughs> First of all, it has to go to something that's fixed by W prime. It has to go into the fixed space. And then it determines everything else. Because this thing's W equivariant. Okay, so it's just a reminder of representation here. Hom out of a coset space into a representation is you're taking the fixed space for the self. So what's this fake degree? You know, this is let's just do the calculation. So this fake degree says, take the graded HOM from this coset space into my covariant algebra for capital W. So take the Hilbert series for the W prime invariance in the W covariant space. That's what we have to calculate. This doesn't look so friendly, but now there's some characteristic zero trickery we can do. 
So now I have to manipulate it slightly minus. First trick. The W prime invariance in this polynomials mod this ideal, I can actually write it as the W prime invariance in the polynomials. That's a smaller ring. And then I take the ideal generated by the W invariance, which is a subring, and they're positive degree elements. This thing is a no-no in characteristic P. I cannot do this. So I wrote over here, tricky. It uses averaging tricks, like F goes to the average of F over the group W prime. You need some splittings of rings. Ooh, sorry, I didn't need to do that. You need some splittings of rings. So you need these kinds of averaging sorts of tricks to split off things as direct sum ends. You cannot do this in characteristic P. There's going to be something else that you have to replace it with. Okay, but so this is even bad notation because here I was taking the W invariance in the positive, uh, sorry, the positive degree W invariance inside the ring S is the, the ideal that I'm generating. Here, it's the ideal generated inside a smaller ring. So you really have to, to worry about, oh, you know, what happens when I change the ring and so. I mean, I get into the details, but it's not that hard. You just need to use some characteristic zero stuff. And then this thing, so this the W prime invariance. Okay, I don't know what this subgroup W prime looks like, but it's got some invariance. I do know in characteristic zero that this is a cohen macaulay ring. It's a cohen macaulay ring, and W is my reflection group. Its invariants were generated by F1 through Fn. They are a homogeneous system of parameters. Therefore, they are a regular sequence, and therefore, this ring is a free module over that polynomial subalgebra that they generate. And so I can just take the quotient of the Hilbert series. So I replace this with this. So here I wrote tricky. It uses the fact that the W invariance is polynomial, and the cohen macauliness of the W prime invariance, which is definitely characteristic zero. And so what was the upshot after that long-winded explanation? What's my Q analog of the cardinality of W divided by the cardinality of W prime? It's the Hilbert series of the W prime invariance divided by the Hilbert series of the W invariance. Right, so instead of cardinality of W over cardinality of W prime, you take the Hilbert series and you take the quotient in reverse order. This is a rational function. I don't know what it looks like because W prime is some arbitrary subgroup. It's a rational function in the This one is a rational function. I know exactly what it looks like because I know the degrees of the W invariance, F1, F2, up to Fn. If I know their degrees, I can write this thing down. The point is, the denominator here is sufficient as, as a denominator to make this polynomial. This will be a polynomial in Q. It always works. Okay? And so the corollary is, you take any finite reflection group and any subgroup W prime. So the W prime does not need to be a reflection group. And any regular element in the big group W, you're going to get one of these cyclic sieving phenomena for the coset action, so for a transitive action. This is your Q analog, and the C is doing left translation. And that's where our proto example comes from, if you like. So this is a good proof my view of what was happening with our very, very first example, k element subsets of 1 through a. The symmetric group certainly acts transitively on k element subsets. If your favorite k element subset is 2, 4, 7, and yours is 1, 2, 4, I can find a symmetric group element that takes one to the other. And what's the stabilizer of my favorite k element subset? My favorite is the numbers 1 through k. Right? And the stabilizer subgroup is the subgroup W prime inside W is Sn that's uh, fixed, that, sorry, permutes the first k elements separately from the last n minus k elements. So this young subgroup sigma k cross sigma n minus k embedded in Sn. And so, for example, when k is 3 and n is 7, this <coughs> element, 2, 3, 6, this sub three element subset of the numbers 1 through 7, I want to think of it as a coset for this subgroup that permutes 1, 2, 3 separately from 4, 5, 6, 7. It's the coset represented by this. I write 2, 3, 6 in the increasing order in the first three positions, and then the remaining numbers 1, 4, 5, 7, I put them in the last 
four positions. So this is the minimal length coset representative for this parabolic subgroup inside this you know, W thought of as a coxeter group. And the point is, this coset space, sigma segment seven or S7 cross mod uh, S3 cross S4, these cosets are the same as K element subsets. And the left coset action is exactly the, the action of the symmetric group permuting. Okay. And then who are the W invariants? Well, we already talked about them. The W is the symmetric group, so you have your elementary symmetric functions are your uh, basic invariants. W prime now, it's separately permuting the K, first k variables and the last n minus k variables. The tensor product of two rings, you know, we've got the, the, you can think of the polynomial algebra as tensor product of the first k variables, polynomial ring with the last n minus k variables. Turns out that the invariance in the tensor product for this product action is the product of the invariance. So you just take elementary symmetric functions in the first k variables, you went up to ek. You take elementary symmetric functions in the last k variable, sorry, n minus k variables, e1 up to en minus k. They g this is a reflection subgroup. It turns out in this case, w prime is also a reflection group. These are n algebraically independent generators. I know what their degrees are, so I can just write down what these Hilbert series are. I get one over, you know, for the first k variables, one over one minus q, one minus q squared up to one minus q to the k. And the last n minus k variable, one minus q, one minus q squared up to one minus q to the n minus k. That's the numerator. And then in the denominator, I get one over one minus q, one minus q squared up to one minus q to the n. I take this portion, I get that n choose k sub q. So that was the appropriate fake degree polynomial for this example. And I'll stop there for a break. So. Reasonable Q analog that always works. Remember, Tony was asking me when, what makes a cyclic sieving phenomenon good? What makes the Q analog good? And I said, I like it when it's a product formula. Some of my other answers, you know, on, on different days I give different answers. I like it when it has meaning. So this one, this quotient of the Hilbert series, has some meaning for me. So, anyway. um, any, any questions before I move forward? Where are we going now? Modular. The, I want to understand that GLNFQ example. Why did that happen? We're not over the complex numbers. GLNFQ is not a complex reflection group, but it is in a sense a reflection group. So, any questions? Yes. If you have an action which is non-transitive, I mean, you can also, if you cut this into, into pieces, do you still consider this as a good quantification? Um, uh, yeah, so that's not, it doesn't. I don't have a general answer for a non-transitive action. And it, by the way, when you look, say, in, in Enumerative Combinatorics books, let me again say my advisor's book, Enumerative Combinatorics, Volume 1, <laughs> in Chapter 1, you know, you'll find this thing called the 12-fold way. It talks about various counting problems that come up. You know, you're looking at balls into boxes, and the balls have labels or unlabeled, and the boxes are labeled or unlabeled. Some of them are easier, you know, you get things like binomial coefficients and stuff. Some of them are harder, like set partitions. The harder ones generally don't have transitive <coughs> actions. The actions are in transit. Oh, sorry, I mean, in many orbits. And yeah, I don't have a good answers for those. Yeah, Alex. So, the last line about it explains both for z mod n and z mod n minus one. Ah, uh, yes. So this result is saying we will have any choice of regular element will work. Like, so the W is Sn, the W prime is the SN, SK cross Sn minus K, but now I still have the flexibility since I see any regular element. I could pick the N cycle, the cyclic group that generates, or the N minus 1 cycle. And you remember? The computation I did is this computation. Right, so. That had nothing to do with the choice of the regular element. This is the W and the W prime. Symmetric group Sn, the W prime is Sk cross Sn minus K. It's the same one in both, but I get to choose two different cyclic groups to go with that same Q analog. Because I've got these two different cyclic groups of regular elements. So you evaluate a different group. And I'm, so I, 
I actually did that. You remember on, in my first example of when I did the fourth roots of unity, I had the orbit structure four and two, and then I did the cube roots of unity, where it was a one, two, three, and the four was fixed, and I was plugging in cube roots of unity. It was the same polynomial. It's like one plus cube plus two cube squared plus two cube plus cube plus four choose two sub cube. It works for both because of this. <coughs> Tony. So, this general setup, I'm saying Hilbert series for an invariant ring divided by another Hilbert series for an invariant ring. This is what I consider, you know, a Q analog that I like. It's not a product formula, although in this particular case it is, but for a general <laughs> subgroup W prime, that Hilbert series I won't be able to write as a product. But it's meaningful, it's you know, concise, and so I like it as a Q analog. It's a matter of taste what's a good Q analog, but this is one criterion I use. Any other questions before we go modular? Okay. <clears throat> what about that GLNF Q analog? Alright, so we're going to need some. Yeah, so remember how it worked. The symmetric group is going to turn into the general linear group, GLNF Q. The k-element subsets of 1 through n are going to turn into the k-dimensional fq subspaces of an n-dimensional vector space over fq, so the finite Grassmanni. The n cycles and the n minus 1 cycles are going to turn into Singer cycles. Remember I had this crazy way of embedding the multiplicative group of fq to the n cross, you know, into the gln fq as these Singer cycles of groups. That's, that's going to go, that will play the role of the n cycles and the n minus 1 cycles. So we need some positive characteristics. And Sorry, people in the field, they call it modular analogs. I keep saying that word modular. They just mean situations where you can't divide by the order of the group to the average in tricks. That's modular in their theory. We're going to need analogs of these results, Shepard and Todd and Chevrolet and Springer. And unfortunately, the invariant theory is you know, remarkably harder there um, when you cannot divide by the order of the group, when the cardinality of G is not a unit, so the characteristic P divides the order of G. There are books that focus on the modular case because it's harder. So there's uh, Eddie Campbell and uh, David Vuela have a nice book on modular invariant theory. Uh, Derrickson and Kemper talk about invariant theory just for algebraic groups generally, including finite groups, and they also have a lot about the, the positive characteristic case. So this is a, a good book. David Benson has a book on uh, invariants of finite groups with a lot of information about the modular case. And Larry Smith also has a nice book. So between all of these, you can find a lot of, a lot of good theorems. But we didn't actually find all the theorems that we want. You know, we're going to find some of the ones that are <coughs> We needed more. So we eventually found enough to do the analog. And so let me stop annoying you and just get to some of these analogs. OK, Shepard and Todd and Chevrolet. So first of all, I mentioned this result of Sarah from 1968. If I actually have, over any field, my polynomial ring, and I, I pick a finite subgroup of linear substitutions of variables, if the invariant ring is polynomial again, then W has to be generated by reflections, possibly allowing transvections. Okay, sometimes they'll be needed. And again, you can always choose the F1 through Fn homogeneous, and we should think about this again as part of being special that this is the coordinate ring for our affine space and the quotient, this is the coordinate ring for the quotient space is, uh, again, it's an affine space. Right. And the, the favorite example, you know, that motivated everyone came from uh, Dixon, Leonard Eugene, Eugene Dixon, uh, 1911. K is FQ, W is F, G, L, and FQ, so the largest possible finite group of linear substitutions that we can do with FQ coefficients. And he said, yes, the invariant ring is polynomial. Uh, I've written down these doubly indexed names for the polynomials. This is like Larry Smith's notation. Sorry, I, I don't know. I should have called them something else. But they're called the Dixon polynomials. Not by Dixon, but by Larry. Um, or they might be by the topologists, too. Um, the Dixon polynomial DNI in this list you can say exactly what its degree is. It's of degree q to the n minus q to the i. And I always need to know those degrees because I keep doing these Hilbert series calculations where the degrees of the invariants come up. 
And why do I know that it's a degree Q to the n minus Q to the i? Because these Dixon polynomials have a beautiful description completely Q analogous to the elementary symmetric functions. This Dixon polynomials, they're what you get when you take this monic polynomial in an extra variable t. So don't just work in x1 through xn. Throw in a new variable t. Take the product of t plus all possible linear forms with fq coefficients. Let these c1 through cn be any elements of fq. So there's fq to the n choices. Write down t plus that linear form. Take the product. Expand this out. You'll get a monic polynomial of degree q to the n. Right? There are q to the n terms here. And each of these is a t plus some linear function of the x i's. So it'll be monic with t q to the n as its leading uh, power in t. And then it turns out all of the other powers of t that show up with non-zero coefficients <coughs> have to be q to the something. You're going to get t q to the i with some coefficient in front. Any other power of t, which is not a q to the i power, it vanishes. You get cancellations in characteristic b. And so the coefficients in front of these t q to the i powers, uh, d n i is the coefficient in front of t q to the i. Since this thing, if it is homogeneous in the t's and the x's of degree q to the n, this means that the coefficient in front of t q to the i, <coughs> the Dixon polynomial, has to be a degree q to the n minus q to the i. Okay? And it's completely analogous with our fundamental theorem of symmetric functions. The e1 through en are what you get when you take the product of t plus variables right, in an extra variable t. You group, you know, combine the, the powers of t, and you're going to get the elementary symmetric function ei in front of t to the n minus i. It's the t to the q. Did we get the, the analogy? All right, so Dixon knew this. Now, what was the point? Sarah was saying, if the invariant ring is polynomial, then you had to be generated by reflections. The converse is false. Some groups generated by reflections, in fact, classical groups over finite fields, Chevrolet groups, they're generated by reflections. They do not have their invariant ring being a polynomial algebra. A good example is one that was worked out by a, a Carlisle and Krupp in 1992. Sorry, I'm going too fast here. Uh, Let's pick q to the odd, so we can talk about a symplectic bilinear form on a two-n dimensional vector space over F2. And then we can talk about the symplectic group, you know, inside of GL 2n FQ, the, the elements that you know, fix the form. When I apply them to the two vectors, the, the symplectic form value is unchanged. So that's your finite symplectic group. And Carlisle and Kropoller actually wrote down a nice description. It's still not a bad invariant ring for this, this group generated by reflections, but it's definitely not polynomial. If it were polynomial, acting on 2n variables, if it were polynomial, there would be 2n generating invariants that would be you know, chosen homogeneously and algebraically independent. No, you need 3n minus 1 generators, and there's n minus 1 relations among them. It's a complete intersection presentation, actually. So this isn't it's not a bad ring, it's an invariant ring, but it's not polynomial. It has a, a complete intersection representation. <coughs> in fact, what you take are just, in the 2n variables, the, the Dixon polynomials starting with the n up to 2n minus 1. So it's like half of the Dixon polynomials for GL2n. And then they had to throw in these other uh, 2n minus 1 generators that can tell you exactly what their degrees are. And then you have these n minus 1 relations, and they can say exactly in what degrees those relations are. Actually, David Benson's book gives a nice proof of this. Carlo and Krop Holler and so My point is here just to illustrate there is no converse to, to Sarah's thing. Sorry, do you need transactions in this case to generate the group? Or? I think, yeah, I think you do need transactions to generate the group. So the converse of Sarah's theorem is not true if you don't allow transactions? I don't think so. That's true for groups generated by uh, by some simple reflections, I think it's still not true that it's a different one. I've got to check that. <coughs> oh, pretty sure. Okay. Can the ring get worse than that? Or is that... Uh... Oh, uh, if you're generated by reflections, I think the rings can get worse, but I don't have an example for you. 
that somehow just being generated by reflections is really not enough. Are they always they're not uh, if they're generated by reflections. Yeah, pretty doubtful, but I, I would have to ask Kemper or one of these guys who you knows tons and tons of examples of pathologies. Yeah. I'm not sure how pathological you can get groups generated by reflections. Okay. Remember, I need the co-invariant algebra. Well, a promising thing that is in the literature. So Mitchell, Steve Mitchell in Seattle is an algebraic topologist. Now, the big topologists care about this for even group cohomology calculations. <coughs> These come up when you're looking at what is it like uh, the classifying spaces of, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I'm going to get into trouble in this audience when I start saying this. Let's just say the algebraic topologists care about these group cohomology calculations and care about these invariant rings in characteristic P. So Mitchell had observed in 1985 that if the invariant ring is polynomial, so what I call a reflection group, don't have an isomorphism between the co-invariant algebra and the group algebra with left translation, you have a Brouwer isomorphism. What's a Brouwer isomorphism? <laughs> it's either saying that, you know, in a Grotendieck group, group of, of K of W representations, so you look at simple composition factors, you write down a composition series, you know, a filtration in which the factors are all simple. We know from the Jordan Holder theorem that those Symbols up to multiplicities occurring in a composition factor, that's invariant. That's like just saying when I uh, you know, have a Grotendieck group in which a representation, and if I have a short exact sequence, I'm setting it equal to the two pieces on either side, the sub and the quotient. Up to that, these two things look the same. They will have the same composition factors with multiplicities. And another way of saying Brouwer isomorphism maybe more relevant for this, and sometimes how we do some proofs, is <coughs> that the Brouwer character values are the same. So we're not in the tame, semi-simple representation theory situation. You have to you know, look at composition factors, these kinds of things. But you can still look at the traces of elements after you do with this Brouwer lifting. Instead of looking at traces of elements and you don't look at all elements, you look at the p regular elements, the elements whose order is prime to p, whatever, if p is the characteristic, those are called p regular elements. Sorry about the regular again. By the way, regular elements in the sense of Springer, they are always p regular, so that's okay. You look at the p regular elements, you don't look at their trace in characteristic p, but you kind of lift their eigenvalues up to characteristic zero, to nth roots of unity, and then you sum up the eigenvalues in a characteristic zero setting. These are called the Brouwer character values. That's kind of like what we want to do. We want to be plugging in roots of unity in a characteristic zero place. And so, yes, the fact that two things that are Brouwer isomorphic have the same Brouwer character values on p regular elements, that is relevant for us. Okay? I'm sorry, this is just like a quick tour of you know, the, the, the not so tame representation theory and positive characteristic, but this is what we have to deal with. Questions so far? Now you know I'm not happy that there's no cyclic action there. So uh, one result that uh, Dennis Stanton and Peter Webb and I, so Peter Webb is a uh, you know, finite group theorist, does a lot of group cohomology and, and modular representation theory. So he helped us to prove the following extension of, of Mitchell's theorem. It's still not going to be enough, but you, know, you can see that it's heading in the correct direction. If our W had its invariance being polynomial, so it's a reflection group. And if C was an element, a regular element again, exact same definition as Frank Springer. He did not consider this finite field situation or the positive characteristic situation, but just literally take the same definition. You say, when you pass to an extension field so that you can find the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors, right, over an algebraically closed field, say, you extend and you call it an element regular, it has an eigenvector that avoids all the reflecting hyperplanes. And then it has a regular eigenvalue of a certain multiplicative order. And then what you're gonna end up with is uh, a Brouwer isomorphism in which you don't just do what Mitchell was doing where you have your linear substitutions and your left translation, your left regular, you throw in the scalar substitutions by that eigenvalue, and you throw in the, the cyclic element in your bio group acting on the right in the group algebra. 
the same story. So literally the same theorem holds in this greater generality. But it's not enough for us. So this is what we really need. So a little bit later, this was uh, Bram Rohr. So, yes, Alex. What, what happens if you stick to some, some sort of W3 parabolic or, or like W plus? Do you still get that kind of isomorphism? Are you going to replace the W on the bottom? With on both sides. Uh, both the, sorry, but uh, yeah, right here. Um, there is still something that I can say. Let me, let me not get into it here. There is still something. I'm about to write down something where there's a quotient of Hilbert series. It's actually true in quite a high level of generality, but not with the cyclic action. You see, I can't even talk about regular elements when I don't have a reflection of them. And no, that's not true. I, I could, maybe I could talk about regular elements. Things who have an eigenvalue which is regularly, an eigenvector regularly. That's a good question. Okay. I, I don't have an answer for it. But that wasn't enough for us. What we really needed is one of these things where you've got fake degrees, where I could take, you know, like W prime invariance. So, uh, Ram Rohr, Abraham Rohr, he's uh, uh, from Montreal. Um, he, uh, <coughs> he's someone who sometimes works heavily in <coughs> positive characteristic invariant theory. And so he and Larry Smith and Peter Webb and I, we, we thought about this and we uh, kind of worked our way and finally we were able to prove a, a result at the correct level of flexibility for us to do this. When I've got my you know, W's whose variance are polynomial, I pick a regular element, and suppose that regular element has order M, multiplicative order M. The only reason I'm doing that is I want to eventually plug in mth roots of unity in the complex numbers. I don't want to be plugging in down in the characteristic P situation. I need to know how to take those eigenvalues that are in characteristic P and lift them. So that's the only reason I'm writing down the multiplicative order. Any W representation U, I'm going to define the fake degree now this way. It's, it's defined as a quotient of some Hilbert series. I take this Homme space from U into the polynomial ring, not the covariant algebra. Notice this is different. So this Hilbert series on top, it's like I'm looking for copies of U inside of my polynomial ring and I put together where they occur in a Hilbert series. Then I divide by the Hilbert series for the invariants. The reason I'm doing it this way, this agrees in the, in the previous situation that I was talking about, you know, I said, take the covariants for W and take the, the hom of U into that thing and take the Hilbert series. There I could do those trickery, the, the characteristic zero trickery. I had splittings, I had semi-simplicity. Here, this is the correct thing to do. You have to do it this way. It's quotient of these two Hilbert series. And this thing is always going to be a polynomial. That is going to use the fact that S super W, the fixed space for W, is polynomial. So this quotient, you, you produce a resolution of this thing. It's a module over SW. It's a finite resolution by Hilbert Syzygy's theorem. Syzygy, Syzygy theorem. And this thing on top is going to be an alternating sum that you can see this will be a, a denominator that cancels everything out so using a, a finite free resolution. So this thing on the right is a polynomial. And when I plug in a complex and fluid of unity into that definition of the fake degree, I get Brouwer character values for regular elements. So I get the traces of regular elements, but lift it up into characters these zeros with things. So Let's just say this this took us some work. You know, this was some technicality. We had to do some resolutions. You know, we had to tensor some resolutions to compare what's happening. There is some geometry hiding behind here, but I don't want to talk about it. You know, it take me a little while to explain how you, what the idea is. It's kind of based on one of the proofs from characteristic zero that was different from Springer's that I think was due either to Costant or Borho and Kraft. So we were modeling it on, on their proof. All right, and the corollary is, if I've got a, a finite set and a, a transitive action 
then again, I just take, for a trans of action, there's an isotropy subgroup, W prime, inside my reflection group. Again, the assumption here is not only W is generated by reflections, but W has polynomial invariants. That's my definition now of reflection. In this setting, if I've got a trans of action, I look at the isotropy subgroup, I take this quotient of Hilbert series, just like before, as my T analog. I want to reserve Qs for the field that we're working. And I will get one of these cyclic sibling phenomena for translating the cosine. And I claim that explains the, our proto example, which you know seemed rather mysterious before. So let me let me go through. That's that's where I'm heading next. I'm just going to explain why it is that GLNFQ analog of the proto example. Why was it an instance of the previous corollary? Any questions before I explain? That? So what was going on there? We had the set X, sorry that this got a little crowded. It was k-dimensional FQ subspaces of V. V was our n-dimensional vector space over FQ. It was this finite Grassmannian. But now I want to think of it as a homogeneous space, right? It's a there's a transitive action of GLN FQ on these subspaces. And the stabilizer of a typical element is this upper triangular matrices whose shape is k and n minus k. By the way, the person who's looking carefully at this is going to realize this is false, what I wrote. And this is actually the Grassmannian of k-planes in V-star. I've actually looked at the dual Grassmannian. Sorry about that. To make this correct, I really want these to be the matrices acting on the coordinates. x1 through xk and x k plus 1 over x. Let's not worry about it. It's OK, so I'm acting on this Grassmannian, dual Grassmannian. It is uh, this situation of a w, mod of w prime. It's a, a homogeneous space. I wrote down before this mysterious formula of a QT binomial coefficient. Q is a fixed prime power, but T was now my generating function variable. I said that later I would explain why we wrote down this particular product formula. And I told you that the cyclic action here was I take my, my field, FQ, I look at its the degree n extension of fq, so fq to the n. We take the, the multiplicative group, and we embed that in gl and fq as these certain matrices. And you get this cyclic subgroup of gl and fq, and that's my, my Singer cycle subgroup. The generator is called the Singer cycle. And so we'll the picture. And then, so one of the things that, you know, early on made us realize that Oh yes, this is a good analog of the n cycles and n minus one cycles. You can check the regular elements in GL and FQ. Thought of as a reflection group. So what do I mean? GL and FQ, it's acting on FQ to the n. Every hyperplane is a reflecting hyperplane. Every single hyperplane is one. Right? This is a favorite example in arrangement theory. It's one of these beautiful, super solvable fiber type arrangements, whatever. It's got a beautiful characteristic polynomial. It's, it came up in Max's talk. You know, it's like one of these modular examples, right? But the point is, when I think of it as a reflection group, so when I start looking for regular elements, I go to FQ bar, the algebraic closure, to find eigenvalues. So when I have my n by n, by n matrices over FQ, and I ask which of those elements, the n by n matrices over FQ, when I pass to an algebraic closure, look at their eigenvalues, and then look at the eigenvectors, which of them never lie on an FQ hyperspace, uh, hyperplane? Because they don't satisfy any FQ linear equations. They only satisfy equations over extensions. It's exactly the powers of the single cycles. You, you exactly have to take the elements that come from FQ to the end cross and embed them in the general FQ in all possible ways. You'll be getting these things. So the claim is these embeddings of FQ to the end cross inside GLNFQ, they are exactly the regular elements in the sense of Springer if you just you know, work over an arbitrary field. They are analogous to n cycles and n minus 1 cycles. Okay. So this is you know, sort of easy linear algebra exercise to, to check this. And what's this guy, this mysterious QT binomial? OK, 
okay, so we wrote it down as this product. Let me write it down in a more expanded way. It's a ratio of this Hilbert series over this Hilbert series. It's exactly the Hilbert series for that parabolic subgroup, which itself is a reflection group in this sense. It, that parabolic subgroup, you know, these pattern matrices, its invariant ring is also polynomial, it turns out. And this was known to Nick Kuhn and Steve Mitchell back in 1986. There's sort of precursor results in the algebraic topology literature. Like Mui has a, a paper in which he's proving some special cases of this. But Kuhn and Mitchell, they wrote down generators for the invariance of that parabolic subgroup that have these degrees that you're seeing in the numerator here. Dixon wrote down the, in the you know, so I wrote down plus Dixon for the denominator, the invariance of GLN. These are the degrees of the Dixon polynomials. So this quotient of Hilbert series is what cancels down to this mysterious thing that we had written before. So this is why we wrote it down, based on these, this quotient. And so the claim is that this cyclic sieving phenomenon that I was saying up at the top is just an example of this more flexible corollary that we had on the, sorry, the previous page. Okay. It helps. Are there some spaces behind all these computations? Yeah, those are uh, petty numbers that you can make for uh, if you specialize the critical one. Love to see some. You, you said spaces. You didn't yeah. say species. You no said species. That like, no grass mud. Yeah. Well, I mean, finite grass. <laughs> yeah, and somehow they come from finite grass monians, But it's no. I, I can show you some other mysterious things. Maybe they're getting at what you're trying to get at. I, I don't understand this. So exactly. What I'm Mitchell, I think Steve Mitchell and Kuhn were interested in splitting certain classifying spaces. Logic. That's right. Yeah. He's, yeah. Like, he's I don't know the Steinberg I makes a right. uh, appearance here, but that was the main idea. Yeah. So I should show you something uh, later. I'll show you something that's along those lines of the kinds of calculations that Mitchell and Kuhn and Mitchell were doing. They actually stole some. Actually, things. in those years, that was the hottest stuff going. Well, now it's <laughs> <not. laughs> yeah. that's cool stuff. <laughs> like it. Okay, so this was this was the the proof I was looking for for this GLNFQ example, and um, yeah, so let me. <coughs> what did they actually do? Um, so let me just say, you might wonder how does Dixon prove you know his thing, and how can you prove these things like uh, Kuhn and Mitchell that you've got some invariants that are of certain degrees and the thing is polynomial. In these next couple pages, I was actually going through some of the techniques. It's just some kind of commutative algebra exercises. So the, the first k that Kuhn and Mitchell write down are just the Dixon polynomials and the first k variables. If these elements have this pattern to their, their you know, these elements of the parabolic subgroup, in the first k variables, they're sending them to linear combinations of the first k variables in an arbitrary way, like GLNF, GLN, GLK, FQ. So the Dixon polynomials in the first K variables are the first Q that they write down. And then what do they do? In the last N minus K variables, they take the Dixon polynomials, but then they further symmetrize them over this upper triangular part of the subgroup. They take the Dixon polynomials in the last N minus K variables, and then they kind of take a product of them with all linear combinations, the first k variables, to make it invariant over the upper triangular part. And then, I'm not going to go through these, these next few slides, but this is actually a good thing to remember. If you're ever wanting to you know, do some of these calculations, you suspect you've got polynomial invariance. Here is a very flexible version of a lemma that all these people use. You know, you'll find versions of it in Smith's book and Benson's book, certainly in Kemper and, and Derrickson's book. If you're trying to show that f1 through fn, which you know are invariants, and you know their degrees are d1 through dn, you want to show that they generate all of the invariants so that it's polynomial, their lemma says 
<coughs> all you have to check is that they're algebraically independent and that the product of their degrees is the order of the group. That's the crucial thing. You just check. Is the product of the degrees, you already have these elements, you know their degrees, does it equal the order of the finite group? Then you're left with showing that they're algebraically independent. And I'll show you how you do that in a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes. In your non-example from symplectic, given that symplectic form. I'm going to come back to it, yeah. I was wondering which of those conditions fails. Uh, both. Both. Because they, they write down as generators three n minus one elements. And they're working in two n variables. And so they're definitely not algebraically independent. Things that they write down. Yeah. It fails multiply. Uh, just to you know, show you some examples. Notice for the elementary symmetric functions, <coughs> oh, I wrote SN instead of fracture SN, sorry. But anyway, their degrees are 1, 2 up to n, and of course, the product of 1 through 2, 3 up to n is n factorial, which is the size of the symmetric group. And they're algebraically independent, we have to show by all these conditions. Uh, for GLNFQ, notice these Dixon polynomials. Their cardinalities are q to the n minus q to the n minus q to the n minus 1, dot, 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 down to q to the n minus q, q to the n minus q to the 0. That product is the size of the general major. This is an easy, easy exercise. Pick the first column of your invertible matrix by picking any non-zero vector. Pick the second column subsequently by picking any vector that doesn't lie on the line spanned by the first column. There's Q choices you have to avoid. And so on down the line. Pick the third column. So this is the size of the general major. It's the product of those two So these numerologic checks are easy. Uh, in this parabolic case, you know, they wrote down the degrees. You can check the size of this parabolic subgroup is size of a GLK, size of a GLN minus K, and then this upper triangular part can be arbitrary Q to the K times N minus K choices. You check those degrees, they multiply together, right? So that numerologic check is easy. And then checking the invariance, usually you wrote down some invariance thinking about you know, how you would get invariant polynomials, it's usually not hard to check that. Let me, let me skip that in the Kuhn and Mitchell case. You know. They basically uh, tried to start with these Dixon polynomials in the last few variables and then symmetrized over this, uh, what would this be, the, the, the Levy, no, the Levy component is the complement to this. This is the unipotent part of some parabolic subgroup. So they, they did some extra symmetrization of Dixon polynomials to get these things. And the algebraic independence arguments, in fact, what you usually do, do this is what they had to do, is they try to show that the whole polynomial ring in the, all the variables is an integral extension over the things that they've written down, you know, by a sequence of, of uh, steps of integral extensions where first you replace the variables by the, you know, uh, this symmetrized product, and it's not too hard to see that this is an integral extension. Then you take the Dixon polynomials in these, and you know that things satisfy a mnemonic polynomial. So this is an integral extension. And then you take Dixon polynomials in the first two variables, and you know that this is an integral extension. You know, so it's, it's one of these things that's not so hard. And if you know that polynomial ring over the subalgebra generated by your polynomials is an integral extension, then these five things must be algebraically independent. They must give you something that's, whose curl dimension is five since you began with something whose curl dimension is five. There have to be as many algebraically independent elements. And that's the algebraic independence. Of so you can look at these slides later if you care. It's not so hard to actually prove things are polynomial. And now, Tony, let me get back to that symplectic example. This was one of the ones where back when we didn't know how to prove the general result, but we kind of suspected this seems to be true, you know, for arbitrary transitive actions. We actually computed this example a bad way. We checked a CSP for symplectic forms using the Carlisle Kopphall result. So, what did we do? <coughs> Let X be a set of all possible symplectic forms on your two n dimensional space. So that I just need non-degenerate uh, anti-symmetric forms on fq to the 2n, and q is odd. That's a homogeneous space. 
right? Because if you pick a particular symplectic form, you have fixed for me a symplectic group. That's the isotropy subgroup of that form. Now the set of all possible symplectic forms is the, the homogeneous space. And so what we did is we said, okay, if we believe things are going to work right, then when we take the Hilbert series for the W prime invariants divided by the Hilbert series for the W invariants, this one was computed for us by Carlisle and Kropfholler because they told us this complete intersection presentation. So you notice it's a little more complicated. We had to take the degrees of their generators, divide by the degrees of the relations, but they told us what those things were. And then divide that by the degrees from the Dixon polynomials. We still get some you know, product formula. It's all product formula, so it's nice and easy. And again, using the L'Hopital tricks, we could just compute when we plugged in Two to the q to the two to the nth minus first roots of unities, we did this analysis because L'Hopital works. And it was a bit messy, it had to do with cases, but we figured out which, you know, if you give me a power of one of these Singer cycles in GL2n FQ, we checked that the evaluation here was counting the brute force count that we did by hand of how many symplectic forms were fixed by a power of a Singer cycle. It was messy. But it all you know, worked, and it convinced us that there had to be a general result. And the point is, you know, once we had proven this general thing about transitive actions, you would never have to have done this you know, horrible, bad proof. You would just know, and you can write down this formula, and it will count these invariant symplectic forms. So uh, that's end for today. What, what's going to be happening next is, I'm going to come back to those sort of two things in this analogy. I'm, tr I'm trying to convince you that reflection groups and characteristic zero, GLNFQ definitely is like a reflection group. No question, it deserves to be called one. Singer cycles definitely deserve to be called uh, regular elements. And for those who know about Coxeter elements inside finite real reflection groups, they are regular elements. So I'm going to do two things next time about more of the analogy. So there are results from the symmetric group and from real reflection groups having to do with Catalan combinatorics. So I talked about these Q Catalan numbers. We know how to generalize those to real reflection groups. And there's interesting things that happen, and then they happen again in GLNFQ, but they lead to mysteries. So mysteries that maybe people here will help us to understand. And then I'll talk about some things having to do with Hurwitz, you know, counting covers and degrees of covers. That has to do with counting <coughs> multiplication of conjugacy classes in SN. And again, GLNF <coughs> analog formulas that look very similar. So I'll tell you about that. <coughs> Thanks.